I'm feeling a little embarrassed, awkward, almost ashamed to be standing and speaking in front of such luminaries like Justice Vekkatachalaya, Sri Varanasi, Sri Ram Prakash, with an audience consisting of really eminent people like Anand Kundaji, whom I really respect, feel like falling at his feet. And yet, fact of the matter is that the director of this grand play, in fact I would call it circus, that we call life in this world, has asked me to play today the role of inaugurating the Higher Life Institute. So, I have no choice but to try and play this role as best as I can. The first question that comes to my mind is, what do we mean by higher life? And we need to take into account the fact that most people in this room would look at the term higher life very differently from what those outside this room, the man in the street, would look at it. Most people outside would think higher life means higher standard of living. More cars, more smartphones. There is a, a very interesting real life incident in the life of a very great famous actress. She was invited to a party one evening and she wore a glamorous dress, studded it with all those lovely diamonds that she had and when she entered the party hall, the hostess was so stunned and couldn't help remarking, goodness, what lovely diamonds and the actress just looked at her and said goodness had nothing to do with it. <laughs> now we have to recognize that when we talk of higher life here we are not talking of a higher standard of living. Higher life in our case means becoming a better human being, which is very different from how development and progress are defined today, which is becoming a richer human being. Becoming a better human being involves not just following moral and ethical values, but something deeper than that. Many of the people here assembled have a connection with theosophy. Literally theosophy means wisdom of the gods. And the fact of the matter is that this wisdom of the gods is the central theme of all religions. Sri Ram Prakash spoke of universal brotherhood. And that's a fact, as he said. But the religions, and this across the board, today, unfortunately, the world is getting divided in the name of religions. But there is only one God who has created all of us. So how can we ever really justify fighting with each other in the name of that one God? No religion speaks of multiple gods. No religion says that there is more than one creator. Muhammad Sahib, for example, spoke of Rab ul Alami. He didn't say Rab ul Musalmi. And no religion ever says that 
The Bible, for example, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and this Word, this creative power, was behind everything that's been created, not just the Christians. So, this whole point of trying to divide ourselves in any manner, especially in the name of religion, goes against the gist of any and every religion. So what is today the need of the hour is to go deeper into what exactly does our own religion stand for. And here, <coughs> there is a difference between becoming a better human being, which is relative to other people, and becoming the best possible human being, which is becoming a good human being in the absolute sense of the term. And all religions, if we really go deep down at the foundation, the base of them, speak of becoming the best possible human being. What in the Ramayana is referred to as Purusha Uttam. Uttam se Uttam Purush. What does that mean? And how is that different from becoming a good human being? I have in this audience a friend of more than 35 years, Anal Jain. We have been good friends for 35 years. I like him very much. He, I am assuming, likes me very much. And yet, Whenever we have interacted with each other, he is he and I am I. That's central to our experience in this world, that you are different from me. And all religious teachings really boil down to this, that in reality, you are no different from me. When I see Anal or any of you, I see the body. And at the level of the body, no two people can be the same. We are not one. The same thing applies at the level of the mind. There are so many things on which Anal and I agree. And yet, there will always be something on which we disagree. Minds, no two minds are alike. Differences at the level of the body and the mind are natural and inevitable. And yet, the reality of Anal and the reality of me is neither the body nor the mind. We often use the term spirit. Spirituality stands for recognizing what that spirit is. You could use another term soul. A simpler term which makes better sense in today's scientific world is the life force. That which keeps him alive and that which keeps me alive. At that level we are one. And that is going even deeper than universal brotherhood. Saying at the level of the universal, there is no difference between you and me. Actually, we often see so many universities now proliferating all around the world. In reality, if you go to, you know, many of these words take on different meanings over a period of time. Today, when we speak of university, it means a place where we enroll, often after paying a good amount of fees, in a particular course. It could be economics, it could be history, it could be mathematics. And we study under some professors get a degree and most of the time the aim is that we get a degree in order that we will get a job and earn well. In other words, we learn in order to earn. That was not the original purpose of a university. Professor Kieserling explained what a university stood for originally and in my opinion should stand for today. He said, the university was founded in the Middle Ages 
to find and to orchestrate all methods and systems of knowledge leading to union with the one God as the universes turned to one reveals. That means the word university is derived from the term, from the Latin term universus, which means you and I are one. We are all turned into the universe. If we really understand ourselves, Ramana Maharishi often used to ask, central to all spirituality is the question, who am I? Have you figured that out? I am the universe. I am God. And if I can understand myself at that level, you and I are the same. That was the purpose, original purpose of the term university. And how did it function? The students appointed the professors. That's a very important thing. The students appointed the professors. And who were the professors? Those who professed a way to attain this aim. That's how the term professor came. Those who professed a way to attain this aim of feeling that oneness. Those who professed a way to attain this aim were appointed by the students as their professors according to their interest and motivations. Each student had particular interest because at the level of the mind there are interests and there are motivations. There there is differences. So each one appointed their own professors. They chose those who they felt could take them to that goal of universities. And not in view to obtaining academic degrees. It has nothing to do with getting degrees. Those kinds of universities are gone. And in my opinion, the best thing that the Higher Life Institute can do is to convert itself into such a university whereby people can come here to get that flair, that atmosphere for becoming one with the entire universe. Which means the most important thing I feel in the Higher Life Institute is to have people here who have themselves experienced it and are living that kind of life. When Shrikant requested me to come and play this role that I am playing today. He said he was doing so because Navadarshanam, the organization that I am a founder trustee of, has been a great success. And it struck me when I gave it some thought that higher life, the way that we define it, and an institution, the two are different. An institution can never have a higher life. The individual can have the higher life. Institution is a vehicle which can help a person to have a higher life. And a really evolved person has no compunction in closing down or abandoning an institution. It's like, you know, I'm going from here to, let's say, NR colony. I get onto a bicycle. I go there. Once I reach NR colony, I give up the bicycle. Similarly, Gandhi did that with his ashrams, when he started with Phoenix Ashram in South Africa. He just abandoned it and came here to India, started Sabarmati Ashram, abandoned it. Went to Sevagram, abandoned it. For him, the ashram was a vehicle. So every institution is a vehicle. And that institution can play a role in our getting a higher life if it has got people who embody the goals, the ideals that the institution is supposed to stand for. So, Navadarshanam is today a place for a higher life because Gopi Shankar Subramani is there and people get attracted to him. Earlier, people got attracted to Jyoti. So it really depends upon 
who the people are in the institution, even if they do not do anything, as long as they embody that higher life within themselves and in their own lives, others will come flocking to the place just like bees come to honey. Of course, that doesn't mean that an institution should not have activities. Of course, it should. But those activities should be geared towards this aim. In the list of proposed activities that Sri Ram Prakash has suggested, there are there is mention of talks, seminars, discussions, movies. I think they have their place. But you must remember that those who come to a place like this are already convinced that the materialistic life is not the goal of life. So essentially when we have intellectual interactions, we are really trying to preach to the converted. If I try to tell you that look, morality, ethics is a good thing, that's no news to you because you have come here because you know that it's a good thing. Otherwise, you would not have come here. So then, what are the kind of activities that we should have? In my opinion, if we want to graduate from being just a good human being to better and better and eventually the best human being, we have to look for that factor which prevents us from being and that is lack of control over ourselves, over our thinking process. We are all slaves to the thought process. And therefore, there are many creative activities that can be tried out at a place like this, which can help people move from the mere thinking to those levels where they feel that oneness with all others. One example would be music. In 1986 is when I first came to this institute. It was Anand Kundaji who brought me here. And later on, my wife Jyoti and I became very close to him, his wife, and his three children. Whenever we were at Navadashnam and needed to come and do anything in the city, we would first come and plonk ourselves in his house in NR colony, and then do whatever we needed to over here. In those days, it was not possible to make a phone call from Navadashnam to anywhere and tell them that we are coming. We would land unannounced, real artichi as they say, no dates, we will just land up. And they used to welcome us with open arms, saying, we are the urban support to Navadarshan. So we used to stay there. And among the favorite activities that Jyoti and I used to do was to take a walk from his house in NR colony to this institute via the Krishna Rao Park. Today I tried doing that and this place is not meant for pedestrians anymore. I mean the kind of things that I see around, I'm just shocked and amazed. The serenity of the place is gone. That was a very serene atmosphere that existed in those days. That, I'm sorry to say, is just absent. Except in one place, nearby, there is a Ramakrishna ashram. The Ramakrishna mission have a, people have an ashram. There, the serenity is still there. There must be many factors for it. But I would like to point out one thing. I have a friend from the last 40, 45 years, some of you may know him, N. Krishna Swami. He is, he sings. He comes here also? Okay, he comes here also. So that, that contributes to the serene atmosphere here. Now, he is not part of the management at Ramakrishna 
mission. Neither I think is a part of management here. He doesn't believe in becoming part of management anywhere. Even in Gandhi Peace Foundation, he remained away from management. But just by being there and singing, often in Bengali, which most people did not follow, but just there was something in that song, in that singing, by which people felt that oneness. There was, he could evoke something which goes deeper than thinking, which goes to our heart, which goes to our soul, I would say. He was able to evoke that. Similarly, Navadashnam, we often have programs in which we have Kabir songs, Meera songs. Singing is led by Tarakini, whom some of you have, may have known through her Sunat programs, or by Sadhana Taikini of Buoyancy, which was started here in Jainagar, which is now in Lithium Layout. When they come and sing, they are not part of the Navadashnam management, but when they come and sing, so many people come up that we have to put a stop to the number who can attend. Because they all, they spend a few days with them in total isolation from their day-to-day -day rat race and they are able to feel that oneness. So, one of the things that I would recommend is music as an activity. Another I would recommend is humor. The things that we can convey through intellectual discussions, talks, seminars, can sometimes be conveyed much better through just humor. Humor. I'll give you one example. There is a cartoon that I saw once. A man about to jump off the roof of a building, wanting to commit suicide. The fire brigade has been called trying to persuade him not to do that. They are not able to quite reach him, but they are trying to persuade him. Look, stupid of you, don't do that. He said, no, why not? I have nothing to live for. I am going to jump. And one of the fire brigade people has an idea. See, we can't convince him of it. But his wife, she lives in one of these apartments. Let's call her. She will tell him about what he has to live for, that there is something to live for. So let's call her. So she is called. And so the cartoon shows her looking at him and saying, what do you mean you have nothing to live for? The house is not paid for, the car is not paid for, the fridge is not paid for. <laughs> not to me. This cartoon conveys the essence of what we are trying to say when we distinguish our definition of higher life from the other definition of higher life. Because essentially, that is what most of us are doing. I was the other day with a software professional who wants to get up of the right ways, would like to give up everything and go and do something different. Maybe teach in a school, maybe live on the land and become a farmer. So a lot of these ideas and thoughts are going on, but can't do anything. Why not, I asked. He said, you see, I have bought this flat in which we are talking now and it is bought on a loan, mortgage. So for the next 15 years from my salary, 80% of the salary goes to the bank straight. So for 15 years, there is no choice but to be stuck with that. And what kind of a flat is it? It's got lovely fittings. For example, bathroom. I used it because I was a guest there. I can't tell you what kind of shining metals there is in the bathroom and how well the commode has been made and so on. So there's one problem I found. There is no water. <laughs> Why not? I, that was on the third floor. Why not? Oh, uh, there was no electricity yesterday, so it could water couldn't be pumped. So with all, I must have spent probably a few lakhs just on those bathroom things. But no water. So I think we need to we examine the foundations of our life. Because what is happening today is that, yes, we are having more and more gadgets giving us greater and greater what we call comfort. But where is it all leading us to? 
we are running short of the three most essential things to lead a good life. When we talk of higher life, let's at least start with good life. Simple good life requires first clean air. Do we have it? I can see, I can see. Smell the difference between the air that existed in 1990 and that exists now. Krishna Rao Park was one of the best places where you could get the oxygen from the trees. Now those lovely trees, half of them are gone. So, one is clean air. The other is drinkable water. I mean, practically every flat now has that what is it called? The purifier. Whereas, where I am staying, straight the water comes from Vyas River. And it's drinkable. Third, healthy food. No matter what we do, the way the development is progressing today, more and more farmers are giving up their land. They don't want to, I mean, they like the land for the resale price that it brings. They are happy to give it to an urban person or to a developer. But for growing food, nobody wants to struggle. And that's the case. What is going to happen to us, to our basic needs of air, of water and of food? It is necessary for us to think carefully on these issues and maybe humor is one way by which we can convey it. When I say all this, I am not saying that intellectual activity should not be. It can be. But we should be careful to, for example, let me take mathematics as an example. I know of many NGOs which teach children from poor backgrounds subjects like mathematics saying, you know, they are weak in that, let's teach them. That's supposed to be a very good form of social service. I'm not denying it, but point is that, okay, they do that, then they graduate in school or in college or even go to an IIT. Is that what we want to do? Is that really what leads to a truly higher life? The same mathematics can be taught in a different way. To point out what Ram Prakash called universal brotherhood. So what's the connection? It's this. Every single mathematical equation connects what until then was thought to be totally independent variables. In physics, for example, Boyle's law. Until Boyle's law came up, they thought pressure and temperature were totally independent. Now they know that the two are connected. Einstein's theory of relativity, E is equal to mc square, energy and mass, they are considered completely different. When I was in school, I was taught a law of conservation of mass and a law of conservation of energy separately. That the two are not connected. Now the two are cells connected. But, unfortunately, we have not been stressing what that implies for us as living beings. What we do if with an equation like E is equal to mc square is, take a look and say, how? Wonderful. We can make an atom bomb and destroy Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That is what we do with our mathematical equation. But the same mathematical equation can be used to ask ourselves, okay, if E is equal to mc square and each atom existing has fantastic amount of energy in it, what about me? I am this body. This body consists of trillions of atoms. That means there are within me stored trillions of times of the energy that was released in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And if that is the case, who am I? Am I just this material body? Or is there some energy in me? That leads us to questions that reveal the truth of all religious teachings, all theosophical teachings, all wisdom of the gods, which is that each one of us is potentially God. But to do that, nobody who is 
morally of a low order is allowed by divine law fortunately to have the powers that god has to be able to ex to have those powers we need to have the maturity to exercise those powers not for selfish purposes but for selfless purposes and if we want to do that we need to redefine our own goal of life our own concept of what is progress and what is development it has got to be becoming a better human being rather than becoming a richer human being and i think higher life institute is an ideal place to be able to implement that and so i am hoping that this will be a place which will thrive and attract those hundreds of youngsters like srikant who are looking for alternatives they are disillusioned with their present life he could have become a great software engineer like anil has done and made a great name for himself but he wants to follow a different path and higher life institute can be the vehicle by which they can discover that different path and make a great difference to the world and bring about the universal brotherhood which as you pointed out correctly is the real truth